Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Dmitry Kornilov, Director of Software Development for Heladin at Oracle. Graham Rocher, creator of Grails and Micronaut. Wolfgang Weijand, Systems Engineer for Java SE and Graal VM at Oracle. Oleg Shelijev, Developer Advocate at Oracle Labs, working on Graal VM. Dimitris Andretis, Director of Engineering for Corcus at Red Hat. Marcus Isel, O'Reilly Book Author and Developer Adoption Lead at Red Hat. Marcus Kett, CEO at MicroStream. Florian Haberman, CTO at MicroStream. So, hi guys. Good to see you all and happy that you all joined this uh, battle of the Java Cloud native microservice frameworks. Uh, great to have you all here. This is a Q&A session. My name is Richard. I will be helping with all the questions in this session. You can use the chat to ask questions to the gurus. And we have already compiled for you some questions that we pulled from the community for this session. Uh, I would like to start the session by welcoming all of our uh, gurus and micro framework uh, passionists. And I would love to uh, give a quick introduction for everybody so uh, you can get to know everybody. And I would love uh, to start with Marcus. Marcus, can you tell us a few sentences about you and what you're working on? Which one do you want? Yeah. You, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you have two Marcuses on the call. So uh, yeah, Marcus Eisele, um, de developer adoption lead uh, sounds weird, but it basically means um, I'm helping our customers to use our technologies the best, right? So, and uh, to be most efficient at, at doing this, uh, I'm not attached to a particular um, country, but uh, to EMEA as a region. So um, you'll rarely see me um, speaking publicly at conferences, but uh, I have a lot more calls uh, with our customers and uh, engineering teams and just helping them to use whatever technology we have in stock. Um, so Quarkus is a big part of that lately, but uh, also OpenShift, especially the uh, developer side of it, not only um, how to run it or install it, right? So uh, my background is software development since I don't even know, like. Don't tell anybody. I think it's 18 years by now. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, Marcus, for the introduction. Um, I'll go by the, the tiles on my screen. So Wolfgang, you're next up. Yeah, hello, uh, Wolfgang Weigand. I'm here based in uh, Germany, part of the worldwide uh, Java and Graal team and uh, working with the community, developer community, and of course, onboarding enterprise customers uh, with the uh, Graal VM. Yeah, I uh, started a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, yeah, on that road trip, uh, I uh, started with Java at Sun Microsystems uh, and uh, joined BA and uh, so on. So I uh, did three decades of application development in various, several uh, ways. Thank Thanks. you, Wolfgang. Dimitris, you're on the next one. All right, uh, so that's me. I'm Dimitris Andriadis, and I've spent a lot of time working on the JBoss application server project, running the team uh, Wildfly, JBoss EAP, about 15 years. And the past two years, I'm responsible for some, a few cloud native uh, projects in Red Hat, which includes uh, Vertex, Thorntail, uh, some work on Spring Boot, and of course, the, the Quarkus team. Um, so that's what I do. Thank you. The next Marcus is up. Hello, everyone. My name is Marcus Kett. I'm the CEO of MicroStream. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I come from Germany, from Bavaria, uh, Regensburg. Uh, and uh, yeah, I work with uh, Java since almost 20 years now. And uh, together with Florian, uh, we have worked on um, two Java uh, ADIs uh, and migrated uh, the last uh, IDE to, to Eclipse. Um, and we worked maybe five or six years uh, on improving the JBoss uh, Hibernate tools, uh, making it more simple and convenient to, uh, uh, to build database applications with Java to bring the 4GL developers to Java. This was uh, our first 
uh, ID. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, since maybe six years now, we are working on uh, MicroStream, which is a, a framework, a persistence framework for storing object graphs and uh, loading object graphs dynamically. Uh, and uh, this is our new project. We are still contributed to the RapidClips project. Um, and uh, these are uh, is free and uh, the framework is open source. And now with MicroStream, we go uh, open source. Yeah, and uh, I'm looking for, for a great discussion. And uh, yeah, it's great to be here in this session. Thank you. Florian, you're next up. Yeah, um, I'm Florian. Uh, I'm in software development for 20 years or so, like forever. Uh, Marcus uh, said it pretty much all. Um, we've been working uh, on MicroStream since a few years now, and it's uh, market ready. It's a stable uh, thing. And now uh, the next exciting step is ahead of us. Uh, we're going to open source. And I'm looking forward to, to work with the community. Yeah. Thank you, Florian. Dimitri, what about you? Hey, so thanks a lot. Thanks for inviting me there. Dimitri Kornilov. Uh, I'm, an, I'm from Oracle. I'm based in Prague, Czech Republic. I'm a Helidon project lead. I also work uh, uh, with uh, Jakarta EE. I'm in PMC. I'm in the specification committee. I'm also leading uh, some uh, specifications there. Uh, I also have a long development background since ages, uh, since I remember uh, Java version one, let's put it this way. Right? <laughs> Uh, um, that's it. Thank you, Dimitri. And uh, last but not least, uh, Oleg, what about you? Hi, uh, my name is Oleg. I work as a developer advocate for Project Graal VM at Oracle Labs at Oracle. And uh, yeah, uh, that's it. My experience, uh, I was a developer before, and then I kind of migrated towards marketing more and more. Uh, and now I don't get to maintain the programs that they write. I just write them and ship them. And that's, that's it. OK. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, we have our first question uh, from the chat already. Great uh, question from Moss. Um, so interesting question to start with. Uh, which, is, uh, which reference project can you tell about? And uh, who has the biggest one? Um, but who has the biggest one is the, is the wrong question in this context, right? Um, who is the smallest? Is, is, is that the question? So um, I see two dimensions here. Um, is, is a big one, the dimension, um, how, how big is what, what you ship or how, how big is uh, the deployment that you do or uh, more, I guess it's, it's focused on how big is the project in, in terms of in impact or, or nodes or something like that. Um, who has a story to share about that? Uh, nobody is talking about references. I mean, you know that nobody is allowed to do that. <laughs> but uh, we're, we have a little unfair advantage because um, we've invested quite some time to publish uh, user stories on the Quarkus blog. And I pasted the link in the in the chat window um, so everybody can go and look and see for themselves. Um, I could share something that we just recently did with uh, a very selected set of partners we ran something that we called the Quarkus IoT Hackathon. And uh, basically, yeah, you can imagine. Um, so IoT devices, like small thingies um, attached to all kinds of weather or like sensors, geographical sensors, sensors and stuff. And uh, the task was to implement a really small probing application that sends back data to a centralized server. And uh, the challenge here obviously is to keep uh, image sizes insanely small, be able to like push Quarkus native images, uh, Graal VM native images, Jesus, that's going to kill me at, the, at some point, you know what I mean, um, to the uh, IoT devices, right? So, and uh, that, that was obviously a challenge because you can like um, design these images to be literally any size you want and you need to have a certain idea about what you're doing and uh, that, was, that was a fun project to do. If I remember correctly, we're definitely going to run this again. And I hope it's uh, not only going to be a selected number of partners, but more. Um, so I'll, I'll promise to tweet about it. So follow me all. 
<laughs> okay, good. Uh, Dimitri has also posted another link in the chat. You can uh, you can check this out um, for this question. So I hope this is a good answer. Do any of the other guys uh, have an answer to that question? Or do any of the other guys want to share a little bit about that? Okay, I can tell a little bit, yeah. Uh, that was absolutely true. They are not allowed to talk about uh, references, right? So it was a little bit on unfair competition, I would say, right? Uh, but what I can share that uh, one of the English bank is using Helidon and uh, one of a Swedish telecommunication companies is using Helidon too. Uh, we have a lot of customers we don't know about because uh, uh, on their uh, our issues tracker and in our Slack channel, where I usually lots of questions from people we don't know uh, about Helidon, about how to use it, about other stuff, right? And uh, of course, internally, internally uh, in Oracle, Helidon is used in many, many, many internal projects. Uh, it's uh, one of their uh, recommended uh, frameworks, of course, uh, for microservices development. And um, uh, as I said, uh, many uh, teams are evaluating Helidon. We don't have a strict rule actually too that they have to, right? But a lot of them evaluating Helidon and some big, really big projects are uh, you now choosing Helidon as the framework of a choice. Okay, thank you, Dimitri. Um, I have a fo follow-up question for you. Uh, you were talking about um, uh, Helidon, and there seems to be two versions of Helidon. And I've got a question about that. Uh, can you uh, briefly explain what the goal is for the two versions of Helidon? Right. Okay. So uh, we call it flavors, right? So uh, uh, basically, uh, we have a micro profile implementation, which is possibly uh, customers should use, right? It's easy to program it. It's a familiar experience. It's basically the same experience as uh, uh, Spring Boot has, as Jakarta, Quarkus has the same experience, right? Micronaut is similar experience, so annotations, dependency injection, this kind of stuff. To make it fast, uh, we uh, created uh, a reactive micro framework. And uh, this is another flavor of Helidon. And uh, it's reactive, it's fast by design, right? Uh, which is, this is what makes Helidon fast, right? And uh, uh, users actually can uh, choose that flavor for their applications, right? So uh, not, uh, not program in micro profile, but program in a pure Helidon SE. It's quite fun to do, right? So uh, I would say that uh, reactive web server, for instance, is what inspired by ExpressJS framework from JavaScript, right? There are same roots, there are same, uh, you know, uh, design concepts. Uh, we use lambdas, we use um, uh, Flow API, we use other modern stuff, right? Uh, so, uh, and developers have full control there, right? So there is nothing like, uh, uh, you know, magic provided by the framework. Like framework does something you don't know what, right? Uh, in Helidon SE, you have to program it yourself. Uh, it can be a little bit of disadvantage because you need to uh, write more code, right? Uh, but the result is impressive, so it's fast, it's small, and so on, right? So two different flavors. Thank you, and, uh, According to the numbers I have, right? So uh, actually about 60% of users, they do prefer micro profile, right? And about, but about 40%, they choose hidden on the scene. Do you have uh, numbers on how much um, of the Helidon users are from Oracle and how much from outside uh, compared to uh, the micro profile users? <laughs> I don't have these numbers, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, no problem. Uh, another question for, for all frameworks is about uh, Kotlin support, um, because you told about uh, reactive stuff that, uh, that you optimize Teledon for in this different flavor. Uh, and uh, how uh, do uh, all the projects support Kotlin? And is it a first class citizen for um, your micro uh, microservice um, frameworks? Maybe Oleg can tell something about that. Uh, I cannot tell anything about Kotlin support in particular frameworks. Uh, I think Kotlin is a JVM language, so all frameworks should be kind of sort of compatible, right? Because, well, uh, but you just write your Java application, which is like your framework is typically written in Java, right? At least all, all the all dimensions. And then you write your Kotlin stuff on top of that. And I heard that Kotlin Java interop is absolutely superb. Can't vouch for that, but uh, allegedly so, right? So the Kotlin support should be sort of reasonable. 
right? Kotlin definitely works with GraalVM native images. So if you want to achieve like actually uh, like uh, the performance profile that you typically want for the microservices, right? Fast startup, lower memory footprint, like pre-compiled, ready to serve business logic uh, type of performance, right? Flat profile, then you would like to use native images, right? And then uh, Kotlin, Kotlin should, should work uh, well for that. Right. So the details about how well it integrates with the frameworks, how much like implicit conversions are there for say Kotlin coroutines or something, uh, that is where my expertise is not enough. Right. I think all of them actually kind of support that, at least to, to some extent. Okay. Um, Dimitris also uh, posted a link to the chat. You can check this out on the Kotlin support. Um, we have one of the questions in the chat that uh, always comes up. Um, so we have a question regarding, uh, I used to be a Spring de boot developer and wanting to try out cloud native oriented microservice framework. That's a cool term. Um, and basically the question is uh, what's different? What should I use? So um, maybe um, Dimitris, you can ha highlight um, uh, uh, your favorite framework or your uh, recommendation on what mm. to do in this situation? Well, in, in Quarkus, we offer a Spring API compatibility layer, which on top of Quarkus implements about like, uh, you know, a few important APIs, Spring Web, Spring Data, CAS, Security, there are maybe 10. Uh, so you can actually do Spring on Quarkus, if that is what makes you feel you know confident and you can do other crazy stuff as well like combine script spring annotations with micro, micro profile and, and all this strangely works um, we have cases of people that did that we have cases also that came to quarkus and they wanted to go more let's say native the more native apis to quarkus that will mostly be those around either Microprofile, a few Java APIs, or you know new APIs. But generally speaking, uh, the transition is uh, is easy, unless you do something really weird with Spring. People were able to rewrite their applications in a week, uh, and we've seen also this resulting in about thirty percent less code, which is very nice, uh, and. The, the classical use cases, you know, you do that and your application reduces by about half the memory requirements when you stay in the Java space and boots like uh, five times faster. So, so there's a good in incentive to, to do that. And the, the Vodafone story that I put the link there, it was exactly that. They had a case, they had the microservice that was very critical. It was taking, you know, six seconds to, to log in a user. So with COVID, the number of users expanded rapidly and they would, you know, uh, the new instances could not keep up with the load. The Kubernetes would kill them. And then they rewrote it to Quarkus. They brought six seconds down to two and they were happy with that. So, so yeah, so it's a valid use case. We've seen it and uh, yeah, you can do both. A bit of Spring Boot, a bit of Quarkus. Okay, thank you. So we have one comment that says, uh, does that mean they can all do everything? Uh, so let's dive a little bit deeper into the differences. Um, so what about uh, persistence? I see this is something where we have some interesting differences in the frameworks. So um, maybe Dimitri, you can, can highlight what you do on Halidon for persistence. Right, okay, so for persistence, uh, we actually support JPA in full, right? So uh, JPA is a standard, it's Java E standard and recently Jakarta E standard, right? So uh, if you have some uh, uh, monolith application which used JPA, right, it will be quite easy to migrate to Helidon because uh, basically the same standard is used there. Uh, actually, uh, this is our, uh, one of uh, possibly it's our main goal for Helidon is to support standards. Uh, we are trying to uh, support standards in full. We support MicroProfile, the latest version of Tido3. We support uh, some Jakarta components which fits into the microservices concept, right? So uh, JPA is one of them. We need to access databases, right? 
So there was a question on the chat about uh, EJB and other stuff there, right? So uh, I don't think that EJB really fits into the microservices concept. So I suggested to use PR or Tom in this case, right? So uh, uh, if you go to microservices, you really need to, uh, to use uh, API specification, which is suitable for microservices the most, right? And uh, talking about our reactive APIs, uh, then we do have actually the database solution for that too. It's called uh, Helidon DB client, and it's fully reactive non-blocking APIs for working with databases. You know, because uh, then you create a reactive application. Uh, database is a little bit of a problem because uh, there are not too many reactive drivers. The situation is getting better now, but it's still, you know. Uh, so uh, with DB client, you can use the existing blocking, basically, uh, JDBC drivers, and uh, the framework makes it work in a non-blocking way, uh, which is quite convenient, right? I think uh, it's another solution which you may try. Thank you. I, I like to give the whole EJB and Java EE thingy at least a second thought. So instead of just ignoring uh, people having that kind of need, um, I, I think I wanna, wanna really highlight that we're talking about two different architecture approaches, right? So if you're really looking for some kind of migration of existing applications, um, the way to copy code, like from an EJB to a Pojo to a, some a microservice is technically speaking the wrong approach, unless your application is already cut like in a, in a certain way, meaning some kind of business objects, right? So, Typical monolithic enterprise Java applications have these technical layers and are not really cut in a kind of a vertical approach. Um, so if, uh, if you're looking at all these frameworks as a solution to like the next big thing for your existing monolith without any effort, that's probably not going to work in no case, um, just to make that like clear. Okay. Um, we have another question here. Is Micronaut part of micro profile specification? Bram obviously wasn't cleared by Oracle to attend this call. <laughs> um. <laughs> I think they're looking into it, but they're not really something like that. Yeah. Okay, but not not today at least. Yeah. Yeah. So Micronaut it's well is balanced. <laughs> Okay. I think Micronaut, the last answer I think I saw online at least was that uh, they would love to support it eventually, right? If if there is a consensus how to do that uh, well, uh, but I don't think I saw any claims that it implements micro profile. Uh, let's just That's clarify it a bit. Uh, uh, First of all, I pinged Graham, right? So he's offline, possibly he will join later. So I don't know what's going on. Um, and uh, about Micronaut and MicroProfile, uh, the main problem there is CDI, right? So uh, Micronaut uh, can't implement currently CDI in full because it's too much runtime, uh, uh, about runtime orientation of CDI specification, right? And uh, basically there are some efforts now to uh, introduce a new CDI light profile uh, to enable ahead of time compilation uh, in CDI, right? So it would be possible in this case to use CDI in uh, the modern microservices frameworks. I think all of the frameworks presented here, including Quarkus, Helidon and Micronaut. And uh, uh, this uh, discussion is in process now and uh, in progress. It's uh, on uh, CDI mailing list now. And Oracle folks are participating there, Graham participating there, uh, some Red Hat folks are participating there too. So I have a feeling that uh, we are currently kind of on the same page what we are going to do. But uh, uh, if you have some other thoughts, right, just join the mailing list, take a look and uh, you know provide your feedback. Okay, thank you. So uh, coming back to the to the discussion on what differentiates the framework. So we have a little bit uh, of difference here with CDI and the implementation of um, micro profile. Um, also interesting, um, do any of, uh, of the projects support microstream as a persistence uh, a solution as of right now? Well, I checked the microstream website and apparently 
it works with Quarkus, so maybe the microstream people can tell more about it. Maybe Marcus, you can you can answer the question. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, there is no integration uh, existing uh, already, uh, of course, because it's it's not open source uh, yet. So we have announced to open source it. Uh, I guess it's uh, um, it must be open source to be integrated, but it's brand new. Uh, it's it's not really brand new in the market. So we use it uh, in in projects at uh, huge customers since five years uh, or so. But uh, we have launched the product or MicroStream as a product uh, last year at Oracle Co. One. So it, it's it's actually brand new. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think it uh, fits perfect together with all these uh, frameworks because we're a uh, persistence uh, engine and, uh, and uh, the goal is to, to store um, object graphs and loading object graphs uh, super fast and uh, microstream is super lightweight uh, has no dependencies to, to, to anything uh, but JDK of course um, and so uh, I expect it would integrate in, in every uh, microservice framework uh, of course we have uh, tested uh, already all the frameworks and uh, we have uh, um, compiled as a native image with GraalVM that this works. Uh, so I would expect that it works with Walkers uh, and with all these uh, micro uh, service frameworks. Yeah, actually we did uh, a little proof of concept with Quarkus and Teledon. Um, there are no problems as we can see so far. Um, and uh, when we go open source, there should be um, something available soon. And I and also so. guess uh, you you announced a hackathon and the price for it. So uh, together with this open source strategy, it would be a great time to step in and provide an integration for uh, Helidon or Micronaut um, uh, for MicroStream and win the prize with that. Uh, how are the chances of winning the prize if you if you provide something like that? Yeah, this sounds good. The the chance is very high. Uh, but uh, we have uh, 40 uh, reg registered persons uh, already at our uh, workshop on Friday, but uh, people can join and uh, learn uh, hacking about with MicroStream and learning MicroStream. So three or four hours are really enough to learn MicroStream. So this is really uh, simple because it's, uh, it's core Java. Um, so they don't have to learn any query language. Uh, it's Streams API. Um, it's only storing uh, object graph, so we don't need more than four hours, and then uh, everybody is ready for starting with micro uh, micro stream and uh, can write integrations. So uh, we would love to see integrations with um, with anything, um, and then publishing uh, this and uh, yeah, take the prize. Okay, so I hack right away and get right onto it. So. I make a little extra on the side. Okay, great. Um, coming back to uh, a question regarding uh, Java or Jakarta EE. So uh, why can't we just go ahead and do Java or Jakarta EE um, as it is? So why should we use any of the frameworks right now? I mean, you can, right? It depends on your requirements. Um, so here's, here's a little example that I've been talking about in in a couple of my talks just to maybe make clear what the difference is, right? So over the last couple of years, we've moved our architectural solutions from a, a monolithic centralized approach to something that is heavily distributed. And I think the, the majority of these frameworks that we're presenting here today um, is well suited for heavily distributed, even serverless workloads. Um, and that has nothing to do with uh, with any kind of monolithic applications anymore. It's like a completely different architecture style. It's like um, picking a semi truck versus uh, a convertible, right? So depending on your requirements, um, you're more than welcome to choose whatever technology fits your way, um, but you're also responsible for it as like the architect or developer. Yeah, Marcos, I actually can't agree more with you. Right, so uh, we are still use cases for monolith applications and the microservices application is not a 100% answer to everything. Uh, 
right? We need to choose carefully uh, what you choose in actually uh, for uh, your application, right? They can be manual requirements, they can be less requirements, uh, and monolith applications are still, uh, I think, a great choice for some kind of applications. If you are working on some back office application which will never be public, uh, which will have uh, like maximum 100 users or even more, right? It doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't need really scaling core. Uh, it will need scaling just a little bit, right? It can just create another uh, node in your uh, server cluster, right? Uh, it would be okay to use a monolith. It's not a problem, especially if your team has experience with that, right? But if you go to some kind of, you know, public service uh, there, uh, you need scalability, you need scalability for individual components, you need to change the scalability depending on some factors like, uh, you know, weekends and, uh, you know, working days or whatever else. Uh, then uh, for that solution, possibly monolithic approach won't work well, right? So uh, you really need to think carefully. It's uh, uh, each technology has pro uh, pros and cons and uh, it's a trade-offs. And, and and ultimately, it's driven by functional and mainly non-functional requirements, right? So, I mean, there are a couple of indicators. One indicator that I commonly refer to and uh, get slapped in the face again is uh, batch window sizes. So, uh, if you are an insurance, if you only have a batch window of like one weekend a year, and no matter what you do, paralyzing your monolith isn't cutting it anymore, maybe you need to look for for another um, and this. See, this is kind of the non-functional requirement. Sure. One example. That's, that's very, very good uh, what you mentioned, Marcus and uh, Dimitri. So I, I saw uh, many uh, large applications in the past uh, two decades running on application servers. And uh, it's, a, it's a disruptive technology approach with the microservice architecture for sure. And uh, you need to uh, afford this uh, by your budget by your team, by the capability of implementing uh, completely loosely coupled architecture with thousands of microservices. Not all these enterprises, especially in Germany, are willing to go this way. And um, in, the, in the past, they, they can't uh, go away overnight from existing monolithic approaches. Uh, that is more or less a real life. But if they can afford uh, with uh, large investments on smaller teams. We saw these here in uh, logistics in many other areas, but they only a small portion of this. And uh, they, they really need to establish these uh, high skilled people and uh, pay them well to do this and uh, keeping control. Yeah, it's a lot of effort and uh, still running the existing business where the business people don't care about. Uh, how this is implemented. And from, from the architecture developer point of view, it's really necessary to try out new things. And uh, some of them, only a few are now uh, here in Germany, they're using uh, different um, microservice frameworks. They're trying this for their best fit to their technical requirements. And uh, this is really a high tension approach and, and a, a, a really uh, great way to walk with, with this new approach, but um, not the majority uh, did this in the past 10 years, but they all want to be there and not all are really considering what's the effort to get there. What technology, what people do I need? Do I get these people? Yeah? Which language, uh, smaller devices, whatever. Yeah? All this stuff uh, needs to be embraced in one common architecture yeah? and uh, in a lot of uh, separated uh, teams, what you mentioned, Marcus, with uh, a decentralized approach. And uh, this is not something you can do overnight. Can add something? Um, something that some people don't realize that the application servers provide the complete environment that you run your application, you know, configuration, security, tracing, logging, blah, blah, you know, everything was there. Um, when you start writing microservices, whether you have one or 10 or 100, you still need to have the environment around it set up. You need to have full tolerance, health checking, distributed logging, tracing. And this is a significant cost that you'll pay even, you know, from the first microservice. So people, you know, they have to realize what are the pros and cons and, you know, and see if it really makes sense for them. 
or they can stick to the traditional way. Yeah, th that's a, a common question. Do you just trade all this complexity that are hidden in the in the application server um, with uh, small microservices to uh, yeah Kubernetes or OpenShift or whatever cluster? And is this just a shift? So the common developer um, has a nice way to implement a, a cool app and has all the nice stats and shifts away all the effort to somebody else who has to take all the blame. What do you say to people that argument in that way? Which is the same as we did with application servers, right? I mean, there is an, I, th I think Gartner called it inner and outer architecture for microservices. And this is something uh, that like, I as an application server developer, this is like pretty much my childhood, right? So this is where I grew up with, and uh, we've been spoiled with transaction handling and even like the the fantasy of having something like a two-phase commit, right? Um, ultimately, there's there are so many features um, that we don't realize. Like barely anybody knows what happens to non-used session beans in application servers and how they can actually survive for longer. Um, so yes, you are trading complexity and depending on how you look at it, um, you're trading it in for flexibility, right? So you get a lot more complexity, you're embarking on a distributed system, but you can solve problems that were completely unsolvable before. So that's what you get, right? So it's scale and you have to decide. And this is why I think it's insanely important before even picking a technology uh, to think about for what and when you're picking this technology. Yeah. We have another great question uh, here from the chat. Which feature do you want to implement or adapt from the other frameworks since, since this is a great feature and you want it to, to have it? Is there anything that you can think of? Everybody is pretty satisfied. Maybe, maybe this has to do the, uh, with that the frameworks are very, very similar. Oleg, do you want to, you are muted. Do you want to come in and comment this? No, no, it's just, I, again, I don't represent any frameworks here, right? So, uh, but the question is a little bit loaded, Oliver, thanks for asking. This is a, a, a true, in a true spirit of a battle, right? Like, what would you like to copy from, from other frameworks? And obviously nobody will directly tell you that, oh my God, we really wanted that thing. But for the like three years that we've been developing, we couldn't manage to implement that, right? So no one, no one will open their hearts like that. But I think, I don't know, I don't know. I know that like one thing where, uh, where frameworks, maybe I haven't heard any of the uh, represented frameworks here uh, to Excel is something uh, like the actor based uh, architectures, something where people would, would use ACA and actors and, build distributed systems that way. So this is one thing that is uh, that I haven't seen being talked about uh, with either of the frameworks here, right? So I don't know whether this is a feature that anyone wants to have, uh, but uh, it could be cool, right? Marcus could have a say about that. Like he has some history with Lightbent, so he should know about he should know about actors, everything, how great they are. Maybe maybe you should put it on the Quarkus roadmap, Marcus. How about that? Speaking of roadmap, if anybody's interested, this is the roadmap for um, for the Quarkus project. So if you wanna wanna have a look, um, in general, I'm I'm gently ignoring Alex Poke uh, at this point. Um, I think uh, what uh, what I definitely like to see more across the board is uh, some kind of standardized procedure. Um, that gives developers more focus on the real important topics. So whenever I look at uh, this new application server or whatever you want to call it, so the cloud in, in certain flavors, um, I think going forward, what I want to want to see from all frameworks is a more native way of uh, adopting to it. And I don't know if we start calling Docker images or OCI images, the new deliverables like ear files and in, in the past or something. But I'd like to see like a, a common effort to push that forward and and give me personally back some time 
to actually code and not handle infrastructure issues. So um, that that is the one thing. Yeah, I have I'm, one. I'm totally on board with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Quark was all Maven driven. If you've seen it, it's all Maven driven. And for some time we're wondering, you know, do we need a CLI? You know, some frameworks are, they have the CLI. So, so we were not sure, you know, whether it, it should be a good thing or not. So finally we said, yeah, okay, we're gonna do a CLI. So a CLI is on the roadmap. Okay, great. So Graham is now here and we can ask him some questions about Micronaut. So is there, is there something for you that you wouldn't want it to uh, yeah, pick or implement or adapt from another framework uh, to Micronaut? Yeah, I think, um, and apologize for just the internet connection of my house, a power cut and all sorts of things, and I all went horribly wrong. Um, so I'm here now. But um, in terms of uh, things that I would adapt from other frameworks, I think that uh, one of the things that, like, you know, um, <clears throat> uh, bugs me a little bit is, and I think this is my general experience, is that with, my, with uh, frameworks, you, it's hard to create a, a framework that is great across all the different languages in the um, Java ecosystem. Uh, I think like if I look back at Grails um, before, you, you know, I think it had some amazing uh, domain specific languages for the Groovy language that kind of lift the uh, Java users out. And um, with Micronaut, I'm st I still think I'm, you know, trying to find that balance of you know, appealing to different audiences and being general. I think that's the biggest challenge in, in framework design. Uh, how do you appeal to such a, a broad and diverse ecosystem of developers from, from Java to Scala to, to Kotlin to Groovy and so forth. And, and um, yeah, that's, uh, that I think is, the, is a big challenge. Okay, great. Uh, one feature that we always hear about is serialization and how it's so bad for you. Um, how is that with, uh, with these days? What do, what do you think? Is serialization uh, a big problem or are we safe for now? I think it's still a problem personally. Uh, <laughs> I, think, um, <clears throat> I, think uncontrol I think it's a security problem more than anything. I think it's uh, one of the great unaddressed problems really. And uh, hopefully one day it will be addressed more generally and nicely. I think that um, uh, uncontrolled serialization and deserialization leaves massive security holes in your application. And you only have to see the amount of CVEs that have been opened against something like Jackson, for example, or, or any serialization, deserialization library for that matter. Um, so I think there's still a long way to go in that space to figure out like uh, how to make that um, more performant and, and more secure more than anything else. These are exactly the two topics Marcus Kat is always talking about. He's always talking about that microstream serialization is uh, unbroken, so it's secure and it's uh, faster than anything else. Uh, Marcus, how is that possible? Yeah, maybe uh, Florian can uh, tell more in technical detail, uh, but uh, microstream serialization works totally different than the Java serialization. and. Uh, this was the reason why we were not able, um, you know, to use uh, the the Java serialization for for microstream, uh, because it's uh, it's not only um, unsecure, um, it's also limited. Uh, so um, we had to write the uh, serialization from the scratch, and uh, we were not e able to to use any other serialization on the market because uh, Brian Goetz has uh, described this uh, very well in his uh, blog uh, that uh, most of the serializations uh, out there are um, based on the Java serialization, so they have the same problem, um, or they, they focus on on a special format for JSON serialization, for example. And uh, so we were not able to use it. So uh, we, we wrote a serialization from scratch, fundamentally completely different. Um, because of the, the possibility to, um, to serialize object graphs and uh, subgraphs, um, loading subgraphs dynamically. This was one reason. And the, the other thing was security. Um, so with the microstream serialization, it is not possible to, to execute code automatically by deserialization. This, this is completely not possible. 
And uh, this is uh, one of the, uh, the security leaks in the, in the Java serialization that uh, it is actually very easily to, um, to inject code and uh, to exec execute code automatically. Um, and uh, we have beautiful talks at the, the Java Code Conference uh, every single year about this topic. And uh, so this problem is not solved. And um, of course, it's difficult because serialization is, is everywhere. It's used by almost every framework outside. And so, um, but um, yeah, we, we talked to, to Brian Goetz about this uh, topic uh, more than an hour at our booth uh, last year. Um, but there, there was a problem. Microstream was closed source, so um, no way to, to use it uh, in the for, for, for the JDK or so. Um, but uh, now, when we open source it, maybe it could be interesting to have a look on the serialization, how this works, and, and why is it uh, so secure? What's the difference? And um, yeah, people who want to um, use Microstream serialization for a secure way to transfer data. Um, this is really a good fit. Yeah, Maybe. so Florian, um, I also heard that, that there is, uh, regarding to fault tolerance, what I read here, uh, that uh, Hazelcast, uh, there's a, a POC for Hazelcast to have a Hazelcast cluster with a micro stream um, where you can have a, a grid um, uh, that has then has fault tolerance or is, is this a different topic? Mm, yeah, it's probably a fit. Yeah, we uh, we're trying to um, replace the the different serialization engines in in various frameworks. Um, we did it with uh, Kafka, with Pulsar, and uh, now we have the first uh, POC with Hazelcast. And um, main goal is to to get the flexibility of our serialization engines working in these frameworks. So uh, you have the security benefits and um, the performance benefits as well. Um, yeah, this, these are the two main reasons. And uh, this is one of the parts we will uh, uh, go to open source as well. So the core of our um, serialization engine, which is the base of, of the whole microstream framework, and uh, the persistence engine is completely based on that. And I uh, hope we can um, participate uh, or provide um, a huge plus for these frameworks as well. Yeah. Hey, that sounds great. Uh, what about uh, Helidon and Micronaut? How do you handle uh, fault tolerance? So uh, on the Micronaut side, um, there is built-in support for um, Full tolerance retry, circuit breaker, and so forth directly inside the framework. Um, Micronauts development itself uh, kind of predates much of the efforts around microprofile and so forth. So um, we have some built in. And then uh, we're also working with the uh, Resilience 4J community, which is a Resilience 4J is a full tolerance library, um, general full tolerance library for Java. Uh, which includes things like circuit breakers and retry and so forth uh, in terms of and it's, you know achieving massive popularity and adoption so and provides a lot of flexibility so we have a PR that we're collaborating with them to support uh, pull tolerance through resilience for J um, as well and I think in general uh, that approach of integrating popular open source solutions has worked um, for Micronaut in the past. Thank you. What about Helidon? Okay, for Helidon, uh, we implement in MicroProfile, and MicroProfile has a, a fault tolerance specification, right? So we are implementing that. So Helidon has a, a fault tolerance support, let's say, by MicroProfile. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, what I uh, didn't have a chance to answer the previous question, right? So uh, I think uh, uh, it would be great if uh, uh, all or maybe most microservices framework uh, supported uh, modern standards, uh, because in this way, uh, it would be easier to port your code to different runtimes, right? So. 
I'm using Helidon at the moment, and I would like to switch to Quarkus, and uh, the migration becomes really, really easy if both of them do support standards, right? So uh, that's the huge advantages of the standard is portability, right? So uh, sometimes people kind of, you know, miss, oh, okay, portability, it doesn't matter. We choose something more modern and uh, it kind of has nice, cool features, which is cool, right? But uh, in uh, some months, in some years, uh, this uh, decision uh, may be, you know, uh, it could be a pity that uh, they didn't support the standard solution because uh, the framework they use is not supported anymore or it doesn't uh, uh, actually uh, work for the use cases, for new use cases they have and so on. They need to port and uh, porting without standard support becomes more complicated. I can't say that really impossible. No, it's possible, but uh, if standards are supported, uh, in both frameworks, then it's just easier. Okay, is there anything from the Quarker side that you can do uh, to help these frameworks to uh, be more fault tolerant? More fault tolerant as, as in uh, like an Aldi supermarket, maybe. Um, <laughs> it's, it's hard to compare, right? I mean, that, that question alone is, is tough. Um, I, I think we're sticking with uh, what MicroProfile delivers in terms of fault tolerance at that point. Um, and uh, that is that is fair. Like uh, if the community identifies parts that are missing, uh, I mean, our GitHub repositories are open, right? Okay, so uh, what I could have mentioned on, on the Quarker side uh, or even on the, on the microstream side is providing uh, better startup times um, and lower memory footprint or higher performance so that you can um, handle more traffic with fewer nodes. So maybe you're not so easily overloaded or if you, are, uh, um, if you have to scale, you can do this faster. So this could provide, uh, prevent a lot of uh, faults there or um, a backed, backed up queues or something like that. Some of the reactive patterns are as well. You can implement, you know, with less resources. But of course, the programming modules are a bit harder. But uh, that's another option. Okay. So the the Quarkers take is uh, always take what the frameworks do, and we just make it faster. Is is that right? <laughs> um. Um. Yes, I think the Quarkus way is really take the frameworks and through this extension mechanism, drive the frameworks to, to do their initialization at, at build time. And then write in the Java app, the bytecode that will produce this desired end state from which you know you need less memory and it's faster to execute and then you have the added advantage that when you feed it to to graal vm there's less code for graal vm to optimize so i think that's 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 the right approach okay great just looking through the, th the chat we have another question um on testing so is there any special uh, testing tools or environment uh, that people should use with, uh, my, with these microservice frameworks or is it all the same? Or is there any technique that is preferred or has excelled uh, to be used with these frameworks? So um, with one of the things with Micronaut, uh, you know, when we designed it and, and it was first released and one of the things that I think it really changed you know, from a Java developer's perspective is the speed at which uh, you can bootstrap integration and functional tests. Uh, so Micronauts test framework literally allows you to run hundreds, thousands of integration tests, um, uh, you know, very quickly because the server uh, boots so fast that uh, essentially functional tests feel like unit tests. And I think that is a big change from you know, traditional frameworks, which uh, have in the past taken several seconds to bootstrap. And therefore, architecturally, what you would do is you would have um, uh, a lot of mock uh, tests or a, or a mocking framework, like mock MVC in Spring, 
or something like that, where you essentially have to mock out a lot of the infrastructure in order to uh, kind of simulate or reduce your startup time artificially. Uh-huh. And I've seen a lot in the past projects essentially abandoning the use of integration functional testing because the server takes so long to start up and um, writing a lot of unit tests and very few functional tests because those take 30 seconds, whatever, to start up. And uh, we really wanted to move away from that and make it so that uh, functional testing a microservice application or a service application is as instantaneous um, as possible. And that's a, an interesting side effect of fast startup time and efficient application frameworks, right? Uh, where you can essentially run tests and they, they, they run instantly and there's no, no waiting for a round, which makes, which ha- which makes a, a, a big difference in terms of doing things like test-driven development um, with these frameworks. And that functional tests run so quickly. Okay, any other uh, comments on testing? I put a link to the chat. So in the latest version of Candidon, uh, we introduced a new, uh, like a simplification for testing. It's Candidon test annotation. So you basically, uh, this is GUnit 5 extension. You annotate your test with Candidon test and uh, it will automatically enable CDI container for you, right? So your test, uh, uh, will become a part of CDI with all the advantages of injecting stuff inside, uh, with using, uh, you know, uh, other CDI beams and so on and so on and so on. It's really convenient for uh, testing. Give it a try. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so. What we, what we learned so far is that, that uh, testing is made easier because it's faster. What about uh, microstream? How, how do you perceive this? Is, this? is this a good fit to have um, a test data in microstream so you can test um, data-driven applications with more data or is, is this something that is not working? Yeah, um, Microstream uh, follows the the interface first approach in its API design. So pretty much every piece of the framework can be uh, mocked very easily. And uh, since our very quick startup time, um, you can uh, use test data from Microstream as well to do quick mockups to uh, to unit testing, functional testing, integration testing, stuff like that. Uh, that is uh, pretty much a good fit here. Yeah. And, and is uh, there... yeah, the, um, you don't have to use uh, external uh, data sources as well, so you can easily run these tests in, in, in containers in isolated environments, for example. Yeah. Okay. Is there is there any any best practice? So we heard about, about testing, but is there any best practice uh, other than shifting the mindset from these uh, monolithic applications uh, more to uh, microservice uh, world is there is there any best practices that you use for coding or which changed your perspective on the whole on the whole thing you mean uh, testing wise or uh, development in general De- development in general is there something that that you should know as a developer when you when you move or want to move is there something that you should you should keep in mind to, to not to stick on, but to change it? I think one thing that, uh, that is definitely revolutionized testing in general and you know, testing of microservice applications is uh, test containers, which is a project for um, essentially bootstrapping servers and so forth in, in Docker. Um, what it allows you to do is uh, run your application against real databases, whether it be uh, for example, uh, whether it be Oracle or whatever other database you want, and also against uh, real messaging systems, so you know Kafka and whatever else, rather than they bootstrap inside of a container as part of your tests, and um, which allows uh, you to perform to write much better integration tests without you having to figure out how to orchestrate. Um, uh, a messaging system or a database uh, as part of your build or something like that. Um, because the closer you get to production in, in environment in terms of your testing practices, the, the, the better tests you're going to be able to write. And something like test containers is really becoming key 
uh, key testing tool for, for these kinds of applications. And the, easy, the ability to just easily bootstrap a container within a chest, it's just phenomenal. We uh, actually had Kevin Wittek here with us at the conference uh, yesterday at the testing day. Uh, and he's one of the committers of uh, test containers and he showed a lot of cool stuff you can do with test containers. If you missed this session yesterday, uh, don't worry. The, the recording of the session will be available after the conference and you can, uh, can join him on YouTube and find out what you can do with test containers. Um, Besides testing, are there any other shifts that you see or do you, uh, do you think it's all the same, just use another framework? I think it's very important to make sure that the application framework that you're going to use works well with GraalVM native images. Right? <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is a very interesting deployment target, right? Uh -huh. Like you don't have to, you don't have to like be kind of stubborn on making sure that, oh yeah, this is the only thing that I'm gonna need ever, right? This is, might not be true, right? It's a, it's a tool in the toolbox that you should be aware of, right? But it's a very interesting uh, opportunity, right? And so, yeah. I also think, yeah, it's possible to write applications in a modular enough way where, um, uh, where you can essentially take a slice of the application um, of the main application and convert that into a native image and, and serve that part of the application in a kind of serverless mode, for example, in, in, in a serverless context. And I think serverless is an interesting architectural pattern really because, uh, because um, there are some pretty compelling and interesting like cost saving benefit when it comes to the serverless billing model. Um, the, the challenge with Java and serverless has always been the cold start. Um, and with something like native image and GraalVM, you can obtain a sensational cold start performance. Um, <clears throat> with, you know, uh, yes, around a second, second and a half um, you know, on you know, major serverless platforms, which I think is 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 amazing um, and and has huge potential for the future. But the key thing is that. Uh, native images is an enabling technology for that to happen in the Java world. Um, and, uh, and if your application is ready uh, architecturally to be able to go on at one, some point in the future towards native image, that's you know, uh, a huge benefit long-term, particularly in the in cloud building models. I can add a few things for Quarkus. So so in Quarkus, initially, the idea is to enable existing uh, frameworks and standards, you know, that make sense. And in due process, as we discovered what you can do with this build time uh, initialization technology, uh, new things started popping up. So Panas for data access, Mutiny for reactive, Funky for serverless, Qt for templating engine that configures itself at, at build time. <coughs> Um, so I think you will see more and more of these things coming out. Um, and then there's, there's other people that start using this technology and especially the, the native part of it to do things that were not just not possible before. So for example, some people write uh, Kubernetes operators with Quarkus and Go used to be the only way to do it. Um, others experiment with CLI um, tools. Um, IoT stuff, um, telco edge deployments, um, you know, things that we really haven't endorsed, but they, they now are, can do it. And as uh, Grama said, uh, you know, serverless, of course. It's, it's a, yeah, it's a big. Yeah, that, that, that's absolutely the case, uh, Dimitris. And there's, there's, there's plenty of like unexplored application architectures where native image could revolutionize Java. Uh, there's several interesting projects going on all over the place. Uh, one of them is uh, something called Gluon, which allows you to compute uh, um, using native image and GraalVM an application, a Java Rx application into a native iOS and Android application. And uh, the Gluon guys actually got uh, uh, using Micronauts dependency injection, injection layer uh, got that working on iOS. Uh, you might not dependency injection, 
and uh, and glue on to compute a native image that runs on iOS, which is, you know, that's like a few years ago that was unheard of. And that's where GraalVM and native image are, you know, revolutionizing the, the destinations where Java workloads can be run. Um, that just simply wasn't possible before. Uh, there's another good case that just came to my mind. Uh, we had a, a company that were using, well, Quarkus with GraalVM. And, uh, and what they did is they were using the, let's, let's say the Java part, do the usual uh, JSON processing, REST API, you know, stuff. And in the backend, they were invoking R and, uh, and Python scripts to do AI, essentially. So they were using the strengths of its language to you know, do their part and merging all those together in the same runtime using GraalVM. Yeah, so that, I think that um, that's an often overlooked part of GraalVM, which is the, and Oleg can probably elaborate more on this, but uh, essentially the truffle language framework and the ability to natively execute um, Python or, or R or, you know, JavaScript or whatever that other language that is supported by GraalVM is pretty compelling. Yeah, yep. another often overlooked parts of GraalVM is the compiler. Yeah. Which you can use as a JIT compiler just for your normal Java process running on hotspot, right? So if you're running like any Java programs, like you could at least run, test, evaluate them on GraalVM because it often shows better results Right, better results performance-wise, which, as uh, everyone knows here, is money. Right, so there is no reason not to try GraalVM just out of the box for the just your Java application as a compatible JDK. Right, and Talking this about is, I think, this is like, sorry, uh, this is like why I feel people overlook this very much because it's just super transparent. Right, it just. It's, it's so obvious that no one talks about that, how this is like this, this is something that you should keep in your mind, right? Of course, yeah, it contains a compatible JDK. You can run Java applications on them, right? It has a JIT compiler. It can produce different results, often better results, right? And then, and that's it. So it's, it's much more interesting to talk about how you can build a native image out of the thing and then how it enables and opens Kubernetes environments to your normal Java applications, or or how how it brings like how like yeah yeah. So just be no right. There is a compiler that you can use with your normal Java hotspot VM uh, that you should try. If you have performance tests, try it right now, right as soon as possible. <laughs> if you don't have performance tests, then you should start with uh, defining some performance related SLA, right? Figuring out what's acceptable and then talking about performance. And this kind of like goes back to the previous question somewhere, right? But microservices, whether you should like rewrite something or not, right? You should start thinking about the requirements first and then and then like going from there. And yeah. that will help a lot, I think, with choosing the framework as well. So Oleg, you were right. talking about uh, substituting uh, Graal VM for uh, any other uh, uh, VM you're, you're currently using. You were talking about money, but um, can I just use it? Uh, or is there a, a license or what is the, S uh, the SLA in terms of long-term support or uh, what's there to do? Right, uh, Graal VM is available in two, uh, in two like sort of uh, flavors, distributions, right? There is a Graal VM community edition which is the open source project uh, that you can use freely adhering to the open source licenses. There is just, uh, there are a few of them because there are different components, which uh, the team tries to keep as compatible with their uh, other counterparts as possible. So for example, the JIT compiler for the JVM uh, is under the GPL2 plus class pass exception, which is the same as open JDK, right? So Ruby bits under the similar to like normal Ruby licenses and so on, right? But those are open source licenses and you can uh, contribute. You can look at the source code uh, on GitHub, right? This is something that I try to do, like open uh, the source to the runtime and I look at that and like in my ID, like it's all written in Java. So in my ID, I just try to 
kind of uh, look at that and like like understand what the compiler is doing. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a very rewarding process. Uh, yeah, uh, and then of course there is also the Oracle Graalvm Enterprise Edition, which is the commercial product by Oracle, which is differentiates on performance. So the compiler there is smarter, uh, which means your Java applications run faster, uh, even faster, which means that your native image uh, applications are probably also faster because this is the same compiler, which is just used differently for the ahead of time compilation, right? And and there are some other features, uh, but they're compatible uh, in the sense that all applications that run on one will run on another. Uh, so you can, you can if, you, if you want to, if you need support or anything, you can think about getting the product, right? Uh, if not, uh, you can just use the open source bits uh, uh, that you can download, right? So I'm guessing that Quarkus is running on their open source bits and not on the commercial uh, parts. You could do What both. makes you guess? Yeah. Okay. It's up to the user <laughs> to decide if they want one or the other. Yeah. So, and uh, you're basically saying if I pay the money uh, for the subscription, then it's even faster. We are not saying that. Okay, maybe that was maybe, Oracle. Maybe Wolfgang can can say something about that. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's like it's like Oleg mentioned and um, uh, Markus before um, in his talk. Uh, if you want to have a supported configuration, you should go for that. If you don't want any support, you shouldn't pay for that. Uh, uh, if you're a company like Twitter with more than 100 engineers, high sophisticated, Chris Tullinger and uh, the whole team, you can do anything you want. Yeah, uh, It's just a matter of mitigation risk and how you can uh, fix bugs. Yeah, How many people... Uh, can can you uh, employ pay? Yeah, that's that's something. Can you can I do it on my own in my enterprise, or uh, should I have a fair share amount of money uh, for a subscription? It's a model what uh, Red Hat uh, invents. Yeah, this is something what Oracle had learned in the past <laughs> decades <laughs> by Red Hat. Yeah, and and IBM learned it as well, yeah. Because uh, if you run out of engineering, you just buy Red Hat to have engineering, and it's just the capability of really good engineering to be agile, yeah? and that's what a subscription is about. Yeah? The ability to fix bugs, and if customer want to have it, they can buy the subscription by Red Hat, by Oracle, by someone else. Thank you, Wolfgang. Okay. I think this is a very Sorry. fair uh, uh, explanation and a very fair model to use the software. Oleg, do you or want can to I comment? Elaborate? Yeah, 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 I want to comment absolutely. So, Oracle GraalVM Enterprise Edition is a, is a, is differentiates on features, right? First and foremost, the, the compiler is smarter, so performance will be better. Uh, there are some native image features that are currently available only in the Enterprise Edition. Right, so for example, you can use uh, a G1 GC based GC in your native images, uh, giving you a different like memory management profile, which is adaptive, uh, which which features on certain heap configurations smaller pauses, right? So it's a uh, it's not just you it's not just subscription as Volkan said, right? Which the support could be a big thing for you or not, uh, but just to make absolutely clear, it's a different product that differentiates on features as well. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Uh, what is uh, with uh, Helidon Micronaut and MicroStream? Uh, what are the, the support or uh, subscription models there? Oh, we don't have any subscription model. So uh, basically, Helidon is an open source project. Just to feel free to use it. Right? Uh, we provide community support. So we provide a great support. So uh, just contact us by Slack, submit issues, our issues tracker. Uh, we, this is an active project we are working on. Uh, we do have a commercial support for Helidon too, uh, but currently it's only for a cast, uh, for WebLogic customers. So uh, if someone uh, owns WebLogic license, uh, these people are eligible for uh, Helidon support too. Uh, it's great for uh, uh, migration. So if you want to migrate, if you own WebLogic and want to migrate to microservice, 
uh, we would like to make the handed on the natural choice for that, right? Uh, so we support standards and uh, we provide support so uh, customers actually uh, can uh, try migration from monolith to microservices based on handed on. Um, and actually that's it. So about Graal VM, yes, Kili Kili Don is supporting Graal VM in both flavors. So uh, both Enterprise Edition and Community Edition, and uh, uh, it works fine. Uh, no subscriptions needed, so. Okay, great, thank you. What about Micronaut and MicroStream? So on the Micronaut side, um, the, uh, again, it's community support um, uh, right now. Uh, although Micronaut is a little bit different because it's uh, developed and supported by multiple different organizations, um, including Oracle. Um, so there's various ways in which you could look for or obtain support, I imagine. Um, but yeah, it primarily, primarily focuses through open source and community support uh, for Micronaut. And of course, uh, by the, because Micronaut is part of the Graal VM team you know, at Oracle Labs, um, you know, uh, further integration and it's likely a plan for the future. Okay, cool. What about MicroStream? Yeah, with MicroStream, we provide a community edition, which is uh, completely free for any use case. Uh, so no uh, license fees or uh, any subscription for that. Um, and uh, then we, on top of that, we provide an enterprise edition. And uh, yeah, the, the community edition, uh, is super slow and uh, insecure and the uh, rest is <laughs> just kidding. Um, now, as uh, the, the community edition uh, supports uh, all uh, important features, it's uh, the only difference is uh, the connectors to the databases. So the, uh, the community edition uh, supports currently MySQL and uh, SQLite for um, running MicroStream on Android and uh, the enterprise edition um, provides connectors to all the uh, Oracle databases. Uh, so if you want to accelerate Oracle queries 1000x, use MicroStream. Um, and uh, yeah, we have uh, already connectors to um, to uh, the other enterprise databases uh, like uh, uh, MSQL uh, or um, yeah, um, IBM DB2, and so on. So it's in the pipeline, it's uh, tested already. And uh, for the community edition, we, we provide um, support for or connectors for um, PostgreSQL or, or the op open source database like MariaDB. Um, and also the, the open source, uh, the NoSQL database like MongoDB Redis and so on uh, will be supported by the community edition, uh, which will be then um, open sourced. And this is the difference. And uh, we do the same uh, as the Oracle guys with Java. So uh, we provide long-term support be because actually um, all the, the vendors building software um, based on Java um, actually are a little bit forced to adapt this model because we have to support uh, always the, the latest Java version. So you have to adapt the release cycle. So uh, this is the reason why we uh, release um, every six months uh, a new ver new version of MicroStream, and uh, to be able to to provide long term support for the for the major releases, um, so it's it's a really a, a big effort um, to do that and um, to to be able to uh, release um, interesting versions, really uh, major releases every six months. So we have to uh, provide long-term support. And this uh, is um, the benefit for, for the users like uh, uh, Wolfgang mentioned already. Um, so if uh, users want to stay longer on, on, a, on a special, on a specific version, then they, they are willing to pay uh, um, money for that to, to, to get updates uh, and uh, not to be forced to, to migrate always to the latest version, then always you have to make new deployments and so on. So many customers don't want to do that. So this, this is the reason why long-term support is the perfect model and it's, it's fair. And uh, I guess it's basically the same as Oleg said, um, you orient on, um, on the Java side and you pick the same 
model and licenses so that people have it easy if they understand how Java is working and the Java licensing is working so they can pick it, easily pick it up and use it and don't have to figure out a, a total new system, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that brings me to the question of uh, release cycles. I, I know that Quarkus is, is pushing very fast. You guys are very cutting edge, always bringing, bringing new updates. I, I see it basically every month, right? We're actively holding back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in, the, in the first year, we average the release every nine days. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, but is this uh, this is more like is this more like a, a nightly build or 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 no, no, these no. nine it's, days releases? No, no, it's, it was a release. It was a real release, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that that's pretty ambitious. So. Um, what about Helen and Micro, uh, uh, Micronaut uh, releases? In what cadence do you release? So we currently do patch releases on Micronaut every couple of weeks. Uh, so that's like a, you know, two point, uh, currently it's 2.1.2, next one will be 2.1.3, 2.1.4, and, and uh, at, in July, on the 1st of July, we released Micronaut 2, uh, which was a new major release. So that had a longer gest gestation period. Um, but, si but since then, uh, we have been switching, switching around so that now following the release of 2.1, which came out um, the end of October, we're switching to every six weeks, there will be a release. So it will be Micronaut 2.2, Micronaut 2.3, Micronaut 2.4, et cetera, every six weeks. And that's our current release Canada, apart from a patch release every two weeks. Okay, uh, Helen Dawn, uh, we usually have one major major release per year, right? <coughs> so we had uh, two Helen Dawn 2.0 released this year. Previous year we had 1.0, right? And uh, we are planning 3.0 sometimes next year, I don't know when, right? And uh, we are quite agile with releases. So uh, we currently don't have the schedule that we release every X weeks. So we release when a uh, release is ready. Uh, and it can be uh, like uh, in one week, if we have some critical bugs or security um, holes to fix, right? Uh, or uh, it can be next month if we have some new features prepared and bug fixes. So it really depends. Uh, but we are released quite often. So if you check uh, our GitHub page uh, releases section, you can see that uh, uh, usually we release, uh, you know, once per month, something like that. Once per two months, possibly if uh, it's a vacation time summer or whatever, right? So anyway, it's kind of... Okay, so we can clearly see that it's uh, very different from what Jakarta EE does. And we had a mention in the chat that Ivar Grimstad, which is also on the conference, uh, I guess tomorrow, um, he can uh, explain in detail how Jakarta EE releases are, are set up and how long it takes to, uh, to do, actually do them and move the standard forward. Um, okay, we have uh, another inter interesting question from the chat. Um, uh, Marcus, you showed a demo uh, earlier today about uh, uh, database queries with MicroStream, and uh, the asker wants to know: was that on? Was this native image on Graal VM, or or how how was this set up, and and how does it work? Um, it uh, the demo is uh, run on uh, OpenG9, uh, no native image. So, so this was a classical Java application, yeah. no, no native image, no Graal VM, nothing. No, uh, just a classic setup here. Yeah. Okay, so I guess it would be even faster if you would have run it on, on Graal VM, right? Probably, yeah, yeah I guess so. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> great. And, and um, second part of the question, how is it possible that the queries are so fast? What, what's the tech behind that? Yeah, MicroStream works totally different than, uh, than uh, other persistence uh, frameworks uh, like um, Hibernate. Uh, with, with MicroStream, we load the objects into the memory and uh, update the object graph in the memory. And then we create the object graph in, in memory with Streams API. and. Uh, you can build whatever you want. You can build really a 
unconvenient and trash ob object model and uh, so and you can pump gigabytes of data into the RAM, it will be even faster than any JPA query can be because it's uh, the power of the JVM. It's a, uh, yeah, uh, it's only um, core Java and uh, yeah, we do nothing magic here. Only um, yeah, query the, the object graph with streams API and uh, this is super fast and we can use the parallel streams to accelerate it um, and um, it's, um, when, uh, when, when we have problems with big memory sizes, uh, th this was the reason why uh, Florian has choose uh, the, the OpenJ9, which uh, this was in our experience um, was um, very effective and uh, with uh, big memory sizes, low memory footprint and uh, it's an Eclipse project, uh, it's, it works very well. And uh, yeah, we, we choose uh, the, the OpenJ9 for this, uh, for this demo, uh, but and you can also choose uh, the hotspot, um, but definitely when, when you use uh, GraalVM. So we, we have performance tests already that, that proves that uh, the GraalVM is uh, even much faster. So, and this is, uh, this is uh, the main reason. And uh, we, we don't have to uh, send selects all the time to a database. And then you always have uh, the, the network uh, connection and uh, the latencies. So uh, with MicroStream, you reduce your network connections. It's a minimum and uh, it's, um, you can do this in, in parallel. So uh, the more cores your hardware supports, the faster will uh, the input output um, process be. And uh, the, the rest actually is, um, is core Java and core, most people actually, I don't know, don't know uh, how fast uh, um, plain Java is. So, and we were always convinced that this is the perfect way because this is plain Java, this is core Java. You have the perfect query language, you have the perfect data structure. It's everything is type safe. And so we, we love type safety everywhere, clean code everywhere. But when we write query code, then we, we throw it all away. Then you can include your SQL strings, uh, SQL code into the Java code, not type safe, no compiler warnings and so on. So no problem. But at the uh, uh, Java conferences, um, all the time we hear clean code and uh, type safety and so on. But uh, when you write database query, it doesn't matter. So uh, we are convinced that uh, completely being completely object oriented and uh, only having uh, one uh, data model, Java classes, no dependencies. You can do everything with that, so not, not limited. You don't have to adapt your cl classes to any uh, database data model. So this is a perfect way. This is obviously to, to do that. Uh, it's, it's not obviously to, to, to do that in, in our perspective because we, we have learned uh, as developers to use uh, relational databases because they were standard already when Java came up 25 years ago, then the, the relational databases were standard. But uh, if, we, if we had no relational databases when, when Java came up, then we would, we would be convinced that we have to store our object graphs, nothing else. So we don't, we, we, we wouldn't uh, uh, invent a completely new data structure to store data. In, in Java, we use object graphs for everything, for every use case, in any case. So why should we use any different data structure? And we have a, this is the reason. We have a follow-up question on that uh, from Yala. Um, so I do understand from MicroStream that it has different structure than uh, SQL or uh, NoSQL. Um, and how is the Java object graph stored in memory? Um, and uh, I mean Java object graph uh, as binary. So how is the Java object graph stored as binary? Can you, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, maybe Marcus Florian. or Florian?
Royan, we can't hear you. I think you're muted. Oh, okay. Sorry. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, we uh, we don't uh, um, adapt the models from from the databases. We uh, we use the databases as binary storages. So that's uh, uh, the thing we do. And we have adapters to pretty much everything which which can handle binary data. And uh, you don't have to use relational databases to store. You can use uh, plain files, uh, blob stores like S3 in the, in the cloud or whatever you like. Um, but we had to get rid of this uh, conversion. That's the whole point of MicroStream, to get rid of object uh, mapping and uh, this bottleneck. Uh, we use uh, blob stores to, to store the actual streamed or, or serialized data in, in every um, database we, we can adapt to, yes. So you basically take what's in memory at, in the JVM and put it to a file, right? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. OK. Great. We're coming to the end of the session. So uh, for our, our last question, I wanted to, to uh, take a look in the future of Java and uh, how Java will change um, and how our development models will change. Do you guys have any takes on that? No, it's, it's, not, it's not a secret that the GraalVM is evolving the whole Java ecosystem. Uh, uh, even it's... it's uh, <laughs> outside, uh, if you so call the Oracle Labs, uh, but uh, on the other way, it's inside with the Java team. Uh, and um, so we compared the complete uh, comprehensive JVM with all this stuff 20 years, 25 years ago, uh, and now something tiny, fast startup and low memory footprint. Uh, uh, this gives the ecosystem a large booster, uh, uh, that's for sure. And even all the microservice frameworks can benefit of it, whether it's an open source edition or supported version. Yeah. Um, if people really interested in modernizing their architecture, they can benefit from this. And um, of course, the large adoption of Java uh, has it, its own um, yeah, stuff within, but we have other languages as well. C, C++, and uh, Kotlin, JVM languages, all this stuff. Uh, so uh, we, we could have something uh, which brings this more or less together uh, from different angles of languages. And uh, of course, uh, within modernization of monolithic application architecture with microservice frameworks. So Wolfgang, do you think that in maybe five years, everybody is using a Graal VM or is there still like the old school way to do it? Maybe Oleg can look into the crystal ball. <laughs> I think in general, there's, um, there's, a, there's a shift um, that basically means that people are you know, was previously deploying to you know, a single Java virtual machine are now going to be deploying in the future to the cloud, which is typically containerized. Um, and that's why I think that um, GraalVM has such a big, and native image has such a big part to pay because uh, once you move from a single Java virtual machine to multiple Java virtual machines running in containers, uh, much of the efficiency gain from sharing more memory is lost. Um, I think uh, uh, Ole can talk more about that, but essentially that the shift in architecture to the cloud is what's uh, making I'm very compelling. Right, and Oleg will uh, add to that. Thanks, Graham, for that. Actually, this is a very on-point analysis, I think. But just if you're running on cloud and you are not doing microservices, right? You should run it on GraalVM anyway, right? With the for the better compiler, which many people forget about. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, yeah, like, honestly, like, so I'm biased, right? I work for GraalVM team, uh, so I'm biased. And uh, listen to this with a, a grain of salt. And I think that in five years, uh, it will absolutely not be the case that everyone runs on GraalVM. Uh, after all, there are people who are running on Java 6 currently, right? And uh, uh, that is much, much older than uh, five years, right? So I don't think the industry will will shift that much, right? 
But I think in five years, uh, more and more projects will know that Gravium offers certain opportunities right? and would uh, at least consider that as uh, one of the runtimes that, uh, that they like evaluate when they start new projects, right? Whether this is running with a JIT or whether this is with running uh, as a native image, right? Um, or whether this is uh, a runtime for other languages as well. Like, you don't, don't forget, like, it's a very ambitious project, right? Like, the grand vision of GraalVM is to run, like, being a runtime for all programs. <laughs> so it could, could, be, could be that in five years, for example, uh, Truffle Ruby, which is our Ruby implementation, is uh, easily the fastest Ruby by far, right? And, 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 and compatible with the ecosystem, and people are just running that uh, just because it's the best. Right, it's it, that that could very possibly be true. Uh, for the Java ecosystem, I think uh, what we'll get the next LTS in uh, in next year, right? Actually, it's less than a year until Java 17, which is the next LTS. Think yeah, it's that. September, right? Yeah, yeah, it's like what 11 months, and we'll get a new Java LTS. So if you haven't started looking into the new Java releases after like well 11. Right. Then that's the time, and and then the next LTS will be after, right? Uh, after like what three years again, right? So in five years we'll have two Java LTSs, which could change very much, right? So uh, GraalVM is a is an incredible piece of software uh, innovating across the board, but the OpenJDK project moves forward as well, right? So it gets better. Uh, it gets uh, faster, it gets uh, more encapsulated and, and, and uh, easier to evolve forward. So I think very many, many ch things will could change, right, potentially. But like, I mean, it, the Gravium will be the best runtime in five years either way, but still, right? OK. <laughs> As you said, a little bit biased, but uh, also uh, a great perspective for the future. Uh, does anybody else want to comment on, on how the future will look for us developing in Java? I'll have a go. Um, well, first, you know, to give credit to the whole Gravel ecosystem, because it really acted as a catalyst for many of the things that happen later, you know, Micronaut, Quark, Skeleton. Um, it definitely allows us to give a new perspective to Java. And I, th I really think the, the work of the people in this group is, is really crucial for Java to remain, you know, sexy and relevant and bring forward those, you know, 10 million or so developers. So good job there uh, to everyone. Uh, th there's even more interesting things coming. I think things like, uh, you know, fibers, for example, will force us to rethink maybe how we do reactive possibly. Uh, so there's, there's still a lot of innovation, you know, brewing and, uh, and we will soon see the fruits of it. Um, if you think how many people have actually migrated over to micro services frameworks, there are not that many yet, right? Uh, so there's, we have a long ways to go. Uh, technology, new technologies are coming, innovation. So uh, I, think, I think things are very, very positive for Java at this time. I would, Great. Like, I would like to add one thing here. Uh, I think the mind-breaking change may be Project Loom, uh, which uh, possibly, we don't know when it's going to be released, but uh, I guess that within next five years, it's going to be released, right? And uh, uh, with that technology, it's light bait threads. Uh, some older uh, technologies like servlet, for instance, may uh, get a reborn, right? Because suddenly they will become as fast as the reactive frameworks, right? So uh, it's quite a big change, right? And uh, possibly all microservices frameworks, uh, including uh, represented here, uh, should some kind of prepare to that, right? Uh, reactive API is good, but uh, with Project Loom introduced, uh, it's the question, uh, will Reactive Fail uh, APIs will survive Project Loom is actually a question, 
So uh, we don't know yet. And I think that this question will be answered actually after Project Loom is going to be uh, finally released, right? Um, uh, but there are concerns about that. Because Project Loom can provide a better, ex better development experience with the same uh, productivity and performance as the reactive APIs, right? So, uh, uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. So, Dimitri, there will be only one flavor left of Helidon if Project Loom is, is, uh, is very successful in killing all the reactive stuff. No, 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 I don't think so. Uh, I think that reactive APIs will be still there because there will be projects which use reactive APIs, right? And uh, we don't know the numbers yet, right? Because it would be nice to have a nice comparison uh, how uh, performant are reactive APIs versus Project Loom. Um, we did some experience with Helidon, right? And uh, what I must say that uh, Project Loom is great, right? So it's really fast and uh, it's very promising, right? Uh, uh, but our reactive APIs are uh, still very good, right? <laughs> uh. Okay. Any other takes on the future of, of Java and how um, uh, everything and nothing will change? Okay. Then uh, we can conclude this session. I thank you all very much for particip uh, participating in this panel. It was uh, fun talking to you. Thank you for the questions. I wish you a, a good day and have fun uh, at the rest of JCon. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.